Who's been to my color management seminars in the past, let's say in the past six to eight months? Okay. So benefit for you guys have actually changed the presentation. I was kind of getting a little stale with the color management in a nutshell. So um, I've geared this a little bit uh, more towards the presentation. It's going to be a lot quicker, less slides, and basically a little bit more hands-on. So we can kind of see things happen, and people tend to like that a little bit better. Um, same content, pretty much. But the other thing that I'm adding in is basically a piece of the puzzle of actually making a profile right here and now. So um, again, my name is Todd Schneider. Um, I've been with a pro imaging division with Epson for about 13 years now. Um, I am the Eastern Regional Field Engineer. There are only about four of me across the, or three others besides myself across the country. Um, again, we are Primarily, our job is to train and teach the dealers. Dealers have their own support departments and obviously sales departments. And then basically from there, um, the dealers will handle a lot of the support. You obviously have Epson support. When you can't get answers like that is when I start getting involved with my dealers. Um, so I work anywhere from all the way up to Maine, down to North Carolina, and as far west as Ohio. So that's my kind of ge geographic area that I cover. So uh, first thing that we're going to end up talking about is print, uh, printer care. Uh, how do you maintain your printer? How do you keep it working for you? Now, for any of you animal lovers out there, keep your cats off my printer. <laughs> okay? These are the worst guys for basically clogging up the machine. The cat hair gets inside the machine, starts sticking to the head via static. Basically, from there, the wiper blade that's in there cannot wipe the cat hair off and it builds up with ink, it dries up there. At that point, your printer's kind of toast at that point. Um, funny tech support call is we were replacing uh, a printer every three months for a customer. The head of my support department in California called me and said, listen, I need you to do me a favor. Where's Teaneck, New Jersey? And I said, eh, about an hour and a half for me. She goes, we replace, she bought the extended warranty, she's got a two year extension, we can't keep replacing these printers for three years every three months. Can you go take a look? So I said, take a look. Walk in the front door. I said, where's the printer? She goes in the office. Get to the entrance of the office. And I said, I know what's wrong with your printer. <laughs> She's like, what? And I'm like, your cat. The cat was literally sitting on top of the printer. <laughs> and you opened up the inside of the machine. And it was, I mean, covered in cat hair. The other thing as well is dust. Okay, do I want you to plastic bag it? No, because actually plastic bagging, it's probably the worst thing in the world. Because inside the machine is something called DX3 technology. It's actually mounted to the head where there's three ASIC processors mounted to the head. One of them measures temperature, one of them measures humidity. The other one talks to the, tr uh, talks to the other two and calculates a firing rate. So throughout the day, the machine's actually compensating for changes in temperature and humidity. You throw a bag over the machine, it's not getting ambient air. It's getting something that's trapped underneath the bag. So I would say, you know, something more like towel, even an old pillowcase. Just throwing it on top. If your room's not that dusty, then I wouldn't even bother worrying about it. As far as general, how, how do I keep my nozzles from, from, from clogging? Um, bottom line, use the printer. Use it. You bought it, use it. Don't let it sit for a month. You know, it's kind of like going out. I usually age printers, inkjet printers, and reference the cars for every, you know, month that you own a, a car. It's kind of three months for an inkjet printer. So if you let, if you buy a car and you let it sit for four months, are you actually letting the printer sit for a year and a half? Is really what it translates out to. You'll never let it. You shouldn't really let it sit that long. Bottom line, what I suggest people doing, because ninety-nine percent of the people are actually at their computer. Plain paper in the machine, draft quality print, plain paper setting, spit that out every two days, which is about three times a week. You do that for one month, that actually uses less ink than doing one cleaning cycle. But for all of you that go out and run four and five cleaning cycles, thank you very much, because that pays my salary, which is an awesome thing. But bottom line, use it. You know, if you're going away, give it to somebody. I mean, if somebody's watching your house, Somebody should be able to print on the printer. Bottom line, giving it to somebody, allowing them to do it. Or your other option, uh, what I tell a lot of people to do, is if you actually have a computer that's hooked to the printer and you also have a laptop, there's a program out there called TeamViewer. You can basically load it onto the machine that's stagnant and connected to the printer. 
gives you a username and password. Anywhere in the world from your laptop, you can log into that computer and send a print down to the printer. That is what's going to keep the printer going for years and years on end. You know, um, her lady up here, she's had the same printer for seven years, and she never does a cleaning. The bottom line is use it. The more it sits, I don't care if it's ours or our competitions. Anytime you let an inkjet printer sit, it's going to clog on you. You are going to be doing cleaning cycles, or you will eventually be at the point where you have to actually purchase a new printer, which we like that too. So again, keep the cats off the machine, keep as much dust away. One other thing, you know, there are people that bring in buckets of water and, oh, I got to keep my printer humidified and just don't do it. Let the ambient air take care of it. I'll tell you right now, the air in my house, now that my heat is on, I'm at 18% humidity. I absolutely love it that dry. It's not the best thing for the printer, but here's the benefit for me. If my printer dies, or I use up my ink doing cleaning, I just call my boss and be like, yo, I need a couple more cartridges. It's free. Oh, my printer died, I need a new one. It's very easy for me. But for you guys, I, know, I do know how much, I've heard it before, how much the ink costs, you know, and all that stuff. But bottom line, use the printer and you won't have a problem. I promise you. Okay, one of the things I normally do before I print is do a nozzle check. Use a very minimal amount of ink. Would you rather go through and print your whole image? Notice that there are little lines going through it. Then have to clean it anyway. Okay, bottom line, do your nozzle check first. On a 3880, or it looks like that. It's got an auto nozzle check as well, so I don't have to do anything. Saw a couple dots out, cleans up. It's got one dot, cleans again, and then boom, it prints. And it's perfect now, it's ready to go. A lot of the, uh, the ones that have the LCD screen, I usually tell people just do the nozzle check from the front panel, which comes into my next thing is head alignments. Anybody ever do the head alignments on their machine? Good. Anybody not do head alignments on their machine? Looks like everybody else. <laughs> uh, basically, the visual thing for telling you that your heads, heads aren't aligned is you'll have your print. Get something a little nicer to look at. And it'll have a little faint striping going throughout your image. That probably means that you're running bi-directionally, you're running in both directions, you're running high speed, and you've never done your head alignments on the machine. The machine will do great if you turn high speed off and you've never done the head alignments, but why not cut your print time in half? Do your head alignments. Certain machines like the 3880 on up do them automatically. I believe the R2 and the R3000 as well do their head alignments automatically. So why not do them? Printer's aligned, it's ready to go. Print in high speed at that point, which is going to cut your print time in half. So um, basically, there's two, mo uh, two color models, or primarily two color models. And I'm going to be asking a question for a little prize. But um, you have your RGB, which basically is anything that's showing light, anything that's capturing light. So your scanners, your cameras, your monitors, those are all RGB devices. Basically, anything that, that prints. Um, or basically shows color at that point, you're looking at CMYK. It's not an RGB printer. No such thing as an RGB printer. Okay? Cyan, magenta, yellow, black, light black, light magenta, light cyan, yellow. Those are the colors that are in the machine. A printing press where you, you know, get your magazines, that's done on a printing press. That's all done with four colors, CMYK. Obviously, we've extended the gamut and added in light colors to basically increase uh, tonal ranges. We've in introduced a gray and a light gray, or black and light, light black, to basically bring us into black and white technology and be able to have a seamless, nice gradation in our grays. Now there's one other color space that's out there that some of you might work in, and some of you might not work in. Anybody know what that space is? Lab. Who said lab? Lab. lab. There's no blade in it, so don't cut yourself. <laughs> okay, so the biggest thing is, is um, RGB and CMYK, they're kind of like table spaces. I mean, there's specific numbers <laughs> that correspond to certain values, where in lab, it's basically a 3D color space. You're looking at an L value or lightness, which is you're up and down, L star of 100s, 
totally white, L star of zero, it's totally black. And then if you have a plus A value, it's going to be a, a redder. A minus A value is going to be green, minus B is blue, and plus B is yellow. So if I want to turn around and describe an orange, I'm going to have a positive A and a positive B value. But it's three dimensional, so depending on the lightness, you know, it might exist somewhere in this quadrant. And it's very hard with the green grid, 3D grid to point 2D with my finger. Um, but something that might illustrate that a tiny bit better. Actually, I probably have even the best way of doing it right now. Let's go down to that. So you can see all the colors in my uh, A quadrant are kind of basically like a uh, purpley color. Going down in my uh, negative B quadrant, I mean, you're looking at blues. Obviously going over to yellows, or I'm sorry, greens opposite of my red and then yellow is opposite of my blue. So it's three-dimensional color space, basically. And again, you can see the white point on top, and, and your dark points on the bottom. OK. So basically, any color profile that you use Okay, you know, if you use a image profile like Adobe RGB or sRGB or Profoto, those profile, profiles are all created in lab. The values that it reads off of this chart, when it actually creates a profile, it basically reads those colors in lab and it creates a 3D model. Your printers, same way. When you use a profile, you create a profile, it's actually using a lab space to do the conversions. So. This happens to be a comparison, so the wireframe right now is Adobe RGB, and basically the orange, well, on my monitor it's red, not this kind of rust color, but the rust color area that's kind of sticking out of the wireframe is an Epson 9900 using uh, exhibition fiber paper. So in certain cases, basically, the printer gamut's larger than the Adobe RGB. So which is why a lot of people have basically moved into Profoto. But bottom line, the other thing you need to keep in mind is, what do my images look like? You know, can I shoot portrait photography in sRGB? Well, absolutely. The color range for that image, and again, we'll get into this, but the color range for most portrait photographers exists within sRGB. Bottom line, two ways to do it. You could run lab spaces by allowing Photoshop to manage your colors or you could allow your printer to manage your colors. And what that basically does is it uses what's called a lookup table. And that lookup table for a specific value of red, green, and blue has a specific, goes through a lookup table and goes out to the specific colors that are in the printer. So in the case of like an R2 where you're adding in red and orange, that's just another range that it ends up breaking out into. But there are specific, instead of being a 3D conversion, it's basically a 2D conversion. It's taking specific numbers, translating them out to a specific output numbers, and that's it. Very simple, does a great job. You know, honestly, if I put two prints next to each other, one of them doing a lab conversion, which is more accurate, versus allowing the printer to manage the colors, I bet, I bet you everyone in this room would probably pick the one that came out of the driver. Why? Epson's created the driver in the driver color or the lookup table to give you pleasing color slightly warmer, it's got a little bit more contrast to it, and that usually is more pleasing to most people's eyes. So using, you're, you're not doing inferior work by allowing the printer to manage the colors, you're just not going to be as accurate. If pleasing is your thing, then by all means, forget about the profiles, use printer manages colors, and then select your paper type in the driver and you're done. And we'll go through this. So. This image is supposed to be extremely magenta, which kind of does with very poor shadow detail. Everybody, any, anybody ever get this before? Yeah, that's probably a better picture. If you look at the side monitors, it looks a lot better. <coughs> anybody ever get very magenta saturated images and very poor shadow detail? Good. These are going to be some common mistakes that we're going to go over, and I'll show you why they happen. Um, another one is 
prints go green. Anybody ever get green images? Or, ah, okay, good. So at least we'll cover some things when I go. And then the third basically issue is, you know, for those who use let Photoshop determine the colors, and for some reason you put in a profile for Adobe RGB. Besides this one that's on my screen, there's no such thing as an Adobe RGB printer. <laughs> Doesn't exist. I don't know why people choose it. But we'll show you and all exactly, you know, I'm gonna kind of show you some of the things that I've seen to help educate you so you obviously don't make the same mistakes. However, when you make those mistakes, and you waste all that ink and paper. I love it. <laughs> so, with this statement, can everybody kind of agree my printer prints darker? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything wrong with your printer? No, I thank you. For, for those people who might have said yes or grumbling it under their breath so I didn't hear it. What would solve my printer printing darker? Raise your hand. One word. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well, too much what? You're getting it. We're going to end up one simple word. Light. Light is what is going to make your printer print normal or not, or look normal, not necessarily print normal, because the printer is printing normally. Um, normally, brightness on a monitor, very bright monitors with a blue cast is like 7,500K. Normally, when you turn around and calibrate, it says to put it at 5,000K or 5,500. Some people actually go in and they have just like that cooler tone, like myself, and I'm up at 6,500K. And the bottom line is, is monitor showing me 6,500K. I can see 6500K because it's, it's transmitting light to my eye. Well, Todd, what you're basically saying by this picture is if I buy those daylight bulbs, I'm going to get between 5 and 6500K. That's close enough. And you know what? You're absolutely right. But if that's where my lamp is and my desk is over here, by the time that light, that amount of light and that color temperature translates to my print, you're probably in the 2200 range. So in essence, if I held the print right underneath the light and it was roughly a 6000K bulb, it'd probably work. One of the things you notice, if you've ever been to the, J uh, the Photo Plus Expo, we have our booth there, we have a whole gallery wall there. Each print is specifically lit up. Each print has one or two bulbs that are literally illuminating the print. So, case in point, uh, the lights, let's see if we can do. See how much it changes? Even coming from over here. Still changing a lot. So how you're illuminating the print, you literally have to illuminate the print at the same temperature that your monitor set at in order for it to be accurate. How many people take their prints outside to view them? Okay, I got a couple people doing that. Well, guess what? You calibrate your monitor at, let's say, 6,500 or 5,500K. Look what daylight is. It's 10,000, it's totally different color temperature. And if you actually think that you could memorize color from your monitor and then walk outside, sorry, your eyes can't remember color. You could say, oh yeah, 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 that's the color. Oh, that's the sweater that I saw the other day that I like the color on. It doesn't work. So bottom line, same thing over here. Monitors at 5500K illuminate your print at 5500K directly and this, my printer's printing darker is gonna go away. So again, you know, keep in mind the color temperatures, don't go outside and view your prints. That's it's a totally different story. Let me, let me ask you another question. If I don't wanna buy a lamp, because I don't want it hanging over my printer or anything like that, what else could I do? Anybody? 
It's very inexpensive. Lower the brightness on your monitor. If you know you're doing every setting correctly throughout your whole workflow, everything through Photoshop, everything through the driver, and you know the stuff is correct, then turn down the brightness to match the printer. That's essentially what we're doing the other way around of illuminating the print as light as my monitor is. But the problem is, is once you get into like Apple cinema displays, they don't sometimes go down dark enough. There is an application called Shades that will allow you to take your brightness down even further. So another pretty important aspect of doing any type of printing is basically doing your rendering intents. You know, how do I get the colors out? Primarily for any photographer that's out, out there. And actually, before I move on with that, if you're actually a photographer and you have a light meter, put it fairly close to the monitor to take a light reading. Put this on your desk and take a light reading there. You're going to see a substantial difference between the two light sources. Wait, wait. I, don't, I didn't follow that. You take a reading of your monitor. So basically, if you hold the light meter about from this distance away, it's going to pick up the light that's coming off the monitor. Yeah. Then you just take the ambient light in the room, they're going to be totally different. Oh, gotcha. Okay, they're going to be different. Different. You're implying they're going to be the same. No, hopefully not. Oh. Unless you're illuminating correctly, and then you got, got an issue. So actually, one thing I didn't do on this slide, hey, you can go out and buy one of these things. They're five, 600 bucks. Set it up next to your desk. It's, hey, it's definitely better than a desk lamp, but it's designed for viewing color. You have a little control up there that if you actually view your monitor at 7,500K, you could adjust that to 7,500K. You could actually even adjust that to daylight, okay, which is 10,000K, however you want to do it. Why is that good? Well, really depending on where your print is, because it might look good in your office or in your house or where your printing, printer is, but it's going up in a gallery and they're, they're lighting it with a different source. Well, at least at that point, you'll be able to view it. But the biggest thing about getting your monitor and your printer to look the same and feel the same is really for corrections. Bottom line, that's what it's for. It's for making corrections to your file or making edits in order for your print to look correctly in your eyes. So there's two rendering, two major rendering intents that we tend to use um, through Photoshop. There's an absolute color metric uh, rendering intent as well, which pretty much no fine art or photographer actually uses. That would be something that you'd use when, um, if you're printing on Luster and you're sending a proof over to a magazine, and the magazine paper that they're using is, is a lot darker than Luster. Luster's a very bright white paper. And what that ends up doing is it actually prints a tint of the reference profile or the, basically the reference paper that we're using for the magazine. Because again, if your paper's not as white, your colors aren't going to be as bright. So you need to dumb down everything. And that's what an absolute color metric rendering intent does. But primarily for us, you have relative color metric and perceptual. 90, 95% of the time I use relative color metric. Why? Because all it's doing is it's keeping all my internal values the same, especially flesh tones. Very important. And basically what's happening there is keeping all that the same. And basically within the last 10% of the printer profile, it brings all the out-of-gamut colors into the printer gamut. Where perceptual, on the other hand, uniformly shrinks the image gamut to fit the printer gamut, which basically means if you have a flesh tone, it's going to be a little bit of a moving target once the compression is done. So why would I use one over the other? Well, what I tend to use perceptual for is I have I happen to go hiking, or I'm taking a scenery shot, and I took a picture of you know 15,000 trees, and I have a whole broad range of greens, and I want to preserve the levels of greens. That's what I would use it for. For more like nature type photography of mountains, um, if you go to uh, you know Bryce Canyon, you're looking at a lot of oranges, reds, and you want to preserve the levels of orange and reds. But for color accuracy, for color critical type stuff, spot colors, you know, if you happen to use any pantones or anything, or especially in flesh tones. A flesh tone will change using perceptual. It'll actually probably get a little bit more washed out. Relative color metric keeps your flesh tones exactly where they are. So for, for the nature photography, the greens, the oranges, were you recommending perceptual or relative color? Perceptual. If it's, again, similar tone ranges throughout the photograph.
don't necessarily agree with that one. Um, because again, both rendering attempts will bring things in gamut. It's just how they bring them in gamut. Um, I'd be, if I was a photographer and I did portrait photography and I was using matte paper or fine art paper to print my images for my clients, I would never turn around and use perceptual because at that point your flesh tones would get washed out. Based on the fact that it is a total compression, your flesh tone point ends up moving and it ends up getting washed out. Bottom line, don't take my word for it. Test it. Take a flesh tone. I'll put it with perceptual, I'll put it with relative color, color metrics, see if you see a difference. Bottom line, I, I'm almost probably about 95% positive that you will. So, you know, again, when do I choose them? 95% I'm probably using relative color metric. 5% again, nature type stuff, nature scenery, stuff of similar um, colors, I tend to use perceptual. And that's all going to define how literally the wire frame is going to fit to my rust color inner thing, which is basically my 9900 on the exhibition fiber. Just some quick comparisons. You know, again, a 2D model is the same. You're going to turn around and say, well, that Adobe RGB is bigger than the 9900. Well, not according to this. You know, if you look, sure. The very most outside point of a very pastel green is going to be outside the printer gamut. But when you get into very deep aqua tones or looking at the other side of a um, very saturated um, orange, orangey yellow, the printer does a better job. Okay, so how we get these color and gamut is basically the color transform you want to use. And again, for me, my opinion is based on the type of image that you're actually working with. Well, should I make CMYK profiles if I'm going to go down that route, or do I make RGB? A lot of people are going to turn around and be like, yo, Todd, it's an RGB printer. I heard that. It's the driver, it's the front end system. If I'm using my 3880 driver that came with the machine, the driver prefers RGB. It's been written to accept RGB. It'll, it'll take a CMYK, hey, no problem whatsoever. But again, the driver was designed to take in RGB information, preferably. But you're gonna say, you know what, Todd, that, that's a 9890, that's another printer. These are 44 inch printers that we have in our Pro Series. Um, if anybody's interested in one, let me know. I'll sell it to you. But this is a CMYK profile. Well, the bottom line is this came out of a different front end than this. This was the driver, and this was the RIP software. Anybody use Colorburst? Anybody? EFI, maybe? OK, a lot of the RIP manufacturers out there, with the exception of image print, they all create CMYK drivers for the CMYK printer, the way Epson designed it. Again, geared around photography and fine art. Everybody in photography basically works in RGB. And again, that's how they kind of partially design the driver to basically be RGB lookup table out to the CMYK of the printer. So again, if I'm working with a printing press, again, traditionally, it's CMYK. Depending on the front end, again, working with our driver, 4900 profile is going to be RGB. A 4900, or in this case, a 9890 profile, which again is a direct po profile for the printer, that could be CMYK as well. It all depends on how the front end software that's driving the printer, and I'm not talking about Lightroom versus Photoshop or Illustrator versus Lightroom or Aperture. It's what's actually controlling the printer. The Epson driver controls the printer. RIP softwares control the printer. That's where your choice is going to be, whether it be CMYK or RGB. Here's Profoto RGB. It literally encompasses the whole entire spectrum. But again, if your image is just existing in this area, 
what's the point of having all this? It's more information that has to get basically downsampled and converted into the printer space. There's more margin for error when you're working with larger spaces like this. Uh, in truth, how much is the human eye able to detect all these differences? Slim to none. <laughs> but pe people feel better using them. It's like some people use 50, on an R3, people love using 5760. Why? Because it's the biggest <coughs> number. And we love when people use 5760 because it uses the most amount of ink. So here's my Epson dollars XL. This is a scanner that I have at home. Guess what? It's pretty close to ProPhoto RGB. But again, if my image doesn't exist out in this realm down here, then I don't need to use that space. Adobe RGB. CMYK printing press, you can notice the saturation of colors as well. You can't get these when you're going over and sending your work to a magazine. Don't print your stuff out on a bright white luster paper with a luster profile and then hand it to somebody who's printing your photograph in a magazine and expect good results when the magazine is actually printed. Because this printer can print a lot better than a CMYK printing press can. So that's where soft proofing comes in and actually supplying a kind of contract proof to a printing company is kind of important. And we'll do that a little bit. So 9900 versus ProPhoto. Well, like somebody said, ProPhoto encompasses everything. I mean, it literally swallows the printer. But again, now I have to bring out, bring in all these colors that don't exist anyway in the printer thing, and I have to bring them all the way in. And they might not even, probably 90% wouldn't even exist in your image itself. There's a 9900, and then again, Adobe RGB versus the 9900. This is the reason why people are moving to ProPhoto, because there's more room to be able to do edits, and they don't like the fact that the printer could basically print more colors than they could visually see when their prints, or when their image is in Adobe RGB. So, you notice on this one, it's nice and smooth. When I spun around that diagram for you, it was nice and smooth all the way around. Looks like somebody took like a bite out of an apple. They took a bite of the profile here. Literally the whole cyan side and green side of this profile is missing. Okay, this is caused by a couple things. One, you ran out one of these profile charts with nozzles out, okay? If it's missing any of these patches or it's picking up a line in the patch, it might end up reading it as white instead of reading the actual color because the color's not there. Or if there's a huge scratch going down the patch, you're like, well, it's, it's a profile target. It's not one of my images, so it's just, I have this piece of paper that's got a scratch on. If it picks up the scratch, you could end up getting a big dent in the profile like that. Next slide as well. Again, it should be a nice kind of continuous circle. We shouldn't have these dents right here. We shouldn't have where the yellow doesn't even connect to the yellow. That basically tells me that there was a problem in kind of like the green, cyan, blue area on the profile itself when you actually read one of these patches in. So again, if you're ever profiling your printer, make sure your patches are nice and clean when you actually turn around and do that. So what do you need to make a profile? Well, you need a printer, you need paper, you need ink, um, and you need some software and hardware to be able to do that. Um, X-Rite, obviously, is uh, one of the companies, Forefront, probably one of the biggest, um, that make color measurement equipment. They make the Color Monkey, they make the i1, the i1 Pro 2, uh, they make that device that I have. I, it's a, called an i1 Isis. It uses the same optics that the i1 Pro 2 and the i1 have. But the biggest thing with that is I can read in 1,700 patches and not really lift a finger. I just stick it in the machine and I walk away from it. Try reading 1,700 patches with your color monkey. That's not fun. So um, bottom line, and I'll be honest, do, do I recommend making your own printer profiles? Depends where you want to go. There's a goal of perfection. 
which again is your paper, your printer, make the profiles. Can I see the difference if I printed with the regular Epson profile and made my own custom one? Maybe. But if you turn around and you use, and for all those who use it, Epson Premium Luster, there's a profile supplied with every one of our printers for Luster, whether you're dealing with a 38, a 4900, an R3000, uh, even going down into some of the artisan products or even our work, pro there's a Luster profile there. It's, it's there for you. That profile is probably going to be about 20 times better than anything that the color monkey can do. Why? Because Epson uses about a 3,700 patch target to make our profiles. The color monkey uses a total of 108. So again, it's, you're looking at the fact that you, know, you have, in this case, 1,700 patches. I think I can make a more accurate profile than a color monkey can do with 108. Did I just bash the color monkey? A little bit. But bottom line, it is an awesome tool for basically calibrating your monitor. If you don't have any profile, hey, then it's great because you don't have it. But bottom line, most, most kind of vendors, media vendors anyway, they say use this Epson setting and we'll supply you the profile. And again, that's probably going to be something better than what you can create yourself. I know I can make better profiles than sort of what's in the driver and why. It's a $3,500 piece of equipment, and I have a $3,500 piece of software. If you guys want to spend seven grand, then you can make better profiles than Epson makes. But I don't think you want to spend seven grand because you probably didn't even spend that on your printer. So, what do I need to do after that? I need to print out my profile chart, and then right after that, I need to read it in and make a profile. Anybody can make a profile, it's easy. Understanding why it doesn't work is really why I'm here. Because anybody could basically stick this chart into that machine and just tell it to read. Anybody can do that. But again, understanding why you made the profile, oh, the color doesn't look right, that's, that's what I'm trying to help you guys with. Now, anything that we're going to basically go over in Photoshop right now, Epson has basically written uh, the color management guide, or managing color guide, OK? Very easily, if you go to our website, you go to the drivers and support section. And I think there's one for the 3880, another one for the 4900, but I know for a fact there's one for the 2880. Okay, download it, look at it. Wherever the thing says 2880, just substitute your printer name for it. Okay, wherever it says, if it says 2880 Luster, then you know what, substitute your printer name with the type of paper you're using. There should be a profile existing. But it literally will walk you through step-by-step -step windows of what you need to set. But that, and that's what I'm basically going to go over now. This is how to use their color profiles? This is how to use basically workflow through going through Photoshop. What I'm going to cover right now is inside this managing color guide. Everything that I'm going to cover basically right after this next slide. So this is kind of meat and potatoes part of the, uh, part of the presentation. Um, you know, there's one thing I kind of, kind of looked at pride myself on is basically teaching, teaching people how to do the stuff that I do so you don't have to bother me. I'll spend an hour on the phone with somebody. And they'll be like, you know what, Todd, you're so helpful, blah, blah, blah. You really taught me a lot. Well, bottom line, teaching you guys all this so you don't have to call me. You don't have to bother me, OK? Because when you're doing that, you're probably asking me something that I don't know already, which now you have to educate me. And then I, then I feel my ego kind of shrinks down at that point. So basically, you open up your image. Now, I'm going to close my image, OK? And the one thing that I want to do is probably one of the important, most important windows uh, in Photoshop. There we go. So color settings window. You can access this by going to edit menu and go down to color settings. At this point, you have uh, your working space. Again, I do have a Canon 5D. I do shoot it in the P mode. I never turn it off of that because I don't know how to take pictures. <laughs> but the camera does such a good job that I don't need to do it. 
And I don't shoot raw because I don't feel like doing the conversion because I think, you know, I just embed Adobe RGB and it looks great. Well, that's what I'm doing there. Basically how I'm capturing. If I'm scanning, my scanner is embedding Adobe RGB, my camera, I'm capturing, taking a picture, it's embedding Adobe RGB. Guess what? That corresponds to my working space. Bottom line, if you're turning around and you are shooting raw and you're going through your raw conversion and you are embedding ProPhoto, then put ProPhoto up there, okay? Basically what you are doing is you are stopping, you are basically eliminating a conversion step because if I had ProPhoto in here and I brought an image off of my camera, Photoshop would ask me, say, hey, what do you want me to do with this? Your image space says ProPhoto. I'm going to convert it for you. CMYK, again, this is really if you're going to a magazine, you're printing your stuff in a magazine, find out what CMYK space they go to, and that's where you want to set that up. The biggest thing with this window is your color management policies. I want Photoshop to always tell me what it's doing, which is why I have preserve embedded profiles checked for everything, and then the three check boxes underneath. Profile mismatch when opening, when pasting, and missing profiles, ask when opening. If it doesn't exist, Photoshop's gonna ask you. Without these things checked, Photoshop's basically gonna do whatever it wants. Okay, use black point compensation I have on by default. Again, that just when you're sending a file over, if you don't have a, the blackest black point in your file, it automatically makes your blackest black point in the file. And then that's pretty much it. The most important thing I can tell you, and to tell you the truth, I don't even, I don't even care what you have in your working spaces. You could have sRGB, which is a really tiny space, but having the preserve embedded profiles on and your color management policies and having all those checkboxes on as well is probably the most important thing. Why? Well, I'll show you. The file that I'm trying to open has an embedded profile of ProPhoto. So more than likely the, the, the image was shot in RAW, it's converted, and somebody embedded ProPhoto with it. But my working space is Adobe RGB. Well, it's asking me what I want to do. Safest bets use the embedded profile. Do you think I should choose option two? Who's, I, I heard a no over here. Okay. Pass the pen down with a guy in the third row, or fourth row. I wasn't sure exactly where it came from. Okay, what's the reason? What's the question again? Why wouldn't I want to convert the document to the working space? Okay, but there's one major thing you have to keep in mind. Pro Photo is the largest RGB space. Adobe RGB isn't. You always want to convert, depending on whether your image is, you know, kind of existing, you run the risk of basically losing color. I mean, I know especially converting something like ProPhoto to sRGB. But bottom line here, the absolute third option, discard the embedded profile, don't ever do that. Don't ever. Here's the other thing. If the safe, if the safest bet is to use the embedded profile, go ahead and use it. Because now I have the ability to go down here and say convert the profile. Okay, I can choose Adobe RGB if I want and actually see if it made a difference. Well, guess what, it did. So, again, bring it in in the embedded. If you want to check it to see if it's going to do anything, Try it afterwards. The stuff's available. Now, I said to you also before, always convert and never assign. So let's see if I have a fairly decent image that I can. If your existing profile, uh, the embedded profile was sRGB, would it make sense to convert to Adobe RGB? Why? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you more editing room. Yeah. And that's actually kind of what I'm going to show you right now. Okay, so 
not the greatest of pictures, but let's go down and convert the profile. It's an sRGB. Hey, let's bring it to the biggest color space possible. Who thinks it's going to change? Oh, we got a couple people. Oh, come on, people. I saw like hands halfway go up. I saw it. Doesn't change. Again, because it's taking the smaller sRGB space and putting it on the larger space right where it is. Great. So this is where I said before, um, always convert and never assign because let's go down to pro photo. Look what that does. Okay, so what that's doing is, let's just say this is my red point and this is my blue point. There's my green point over there. It basically expands those points up to my pro photo space. So again, not a good thing. Visually, it kind of looks cool, but I'll tell you right now, what flesh tones is, instead of being that nice, soft, kind of tan color, they're going to end up being like orange. You know, your, your reds are going to look like out of this world. They're going to literally like jump off the page, but it's not realistic, and especially when you turn your, you know, your flesh tones and you do it to your flesh tones. I mean, the people look like they just came out of a nuclear holocaust. I mean, it's just not a good idea. So again, always convert, never assign. When would I assign my 10,000 XL that I have at home? I can only embed Adobe RGB or sRGB. I know at that point I can bring that document in, discard the embedded profile, and assign my 1640 XL profile, or my 10,000 XL profile, because I know where the file came from. So case in point, if you discarded the embedded profile, but you have your camera profile, and you reassigned it, well, then it's OK. Because you knew where it came from, so you assigned it from where it came from. So here's my image. Um, another quick note as well. If this is my paper, and this is the way my paper's facing, but this is more like a landscape image, rotate the image on the screen the way you want it to sit on the paper. You'll never have to choose landscape or portrait or which one do I choose, which one do I not choose. You'll always leave it as portrait. You'll always create your, if it's a custom page size, you'll always create your page size accordingly. But guess what? It'll show you exactly the way it's going to sit on the printer. So with this landscape image, first thing I'm going to do, 90 degrees. I'm going to say print. Okay. And again, always leave it as portrait. Hey, guess what? That's how it's going to print on a printer. Super. Why? Did I hear a why? It's a visual. I mean, that's, that's the way it comes out on the printer. It comes in, basically, your top edge is the first edge that comes out. And that's basically the way it comes out of the printer. If I, I can do my landscape, and I can put it in this way, and then I'm still choosing portrait. I'm not choosing landscape because it's a landscape image. All landscape and portrait does is it doesn't rotate your page size. It rotates your image 90 degrees. That's it. So you could technically rotate your image, but not necessarily rotate your paper. So again, rotating it on screen, the way it's going to sit on your paper. If you're loading your paper this way into your machine, then don't rotate it like I did. But this, to me, makes it easy so I don't have to continually go in and, OK, well, this is a landscape image, but I want to make my page size. And I've had this as well, where people have their landscape image. And let's just say it's a 17 by 22, which this machine can take. But on their screen, it's 22 wide by 17 tall. Then they go into the driver, and they make a 22 inch wide piece of paper. So. Everything looks fantastic in the preview, but then they can't figure out where the job goes because it goes to the printer and then it disappears. Or it ends up printing it out in 8 and a half, 11 and cuts off half the image. Why? Because you're basically telling the printer to do a print of 22 inch. 17 inch <laughs> printer can't print 22 inches. So again, to me, this avoids a lot of confusion for people. 
apply the default here to put the shortest stop side into the printer, never to turn the paper. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I 100 percent agree with you. Okay. That's why again I'm rotating a landscape image to go on a portrait piece of paper, basically. And again, I always leave it as portrait. Rotate on screen the way you want it to sit on the paper. End of story. So first thing, I'm just going to correct my page size real quick, and we're going to go right back over. OK. OK. Two ways to print to the printer. Allowing Photoshop to manage the colors or allowing the printer to manage the colors. Allowing the printer to manage the colors is going to give you a little bit more contrasty, a little bit more saturated print, a little bit more pleasing. It's going to be a little bit more saturated, if, tiny bit more contrasty. If which is managing? Printer. It's not as accurate, though. It's not, definitely not as accurate as allowing Photoshop to manage the colors and picking the correct profile. So I have a 3880 here. I'm letting Photoshop manage the colors. Can I use that printer profile? That's why you got to look. You got, for those who could see a monitor, you want to look a little closer. You but the bottom line. The printer and the paper you're using. Correct. Printer and paper. That's a profile for an R3000. I can't use an R3000, whether it be luster or not. I can't use a profile that was generated for an R3000 on a 38 or 3880. Can't use an R2000 profile on an R3000. Can't use a. 4800 profile on a 2880. It's not interchangeable. It's printer dependent and media dependent. And technically, it should really be resolution dependent. So that's something you got to be careful about. Uh, so I'm going to, and the cool thing is, especially uh, for all the Mac users, very convenient now. Anytime you pick your printer, it automatically puts all your profiles to the top of the list. Uh, Luster. I'm using Luster, great. Again, it's not really a nature scene. I want to preserve the blues. I want to preserve the pinks in the tree and the different ranges that I have in the tree. Go to my print settings, print settings, choosing Luster, using our Epson screening, obviously, and off. So I'll move this over to the side. Photoshop's managing, I don't want the driver managing. Can you go to 16 bit at this point so you get the bigger color range? Are your images in 16 bit? Yeah. yeah. If you've taken images in 16 bit, then I would choose a 16 bit option. If you're choosing 8 bit and you're choosing 16 bit option, that's pointless. There's no information there. There's a question over here. Paper profile is simply set when you when you put in the uh, uh, media type, right? No. Because I'm so, okay. So one of the things that media type controls is the amount of ink, the amount of suction, the amount of feed in between each head pass. Because the printer is basically an X Y machine, the paper moves this way, the head moves that way. So right now, because I shut the color management off in the driver, the only thing that that media type is just telling the printer what type of paper it is. How much do you feed the paper? How much ink do you put on that paper? But it really doesn't take care of any of the color. That's what Photoshop is for. So that's why your printer profile, because Photoshop is managing it, I'm picking up that 3D profile. So it does away with the need for setting up a paper profile. If you say Photoshop manages color. You have to pick a printer profile. You have to tell Photoshop that you are taking Prophoto RGB. Photoshop's going to do a 3D conversion on that, 3D lab conversion, and convert that to my 3880 printing on luster, which is exactly what I picked. And then when I go into the driver, I have to still tell it what type of paper it is. It's going to use Epson screening, which is that AccuPhoto HD2. But the color mode is off. Color mode is off. Why? Because Photoshop's handling the conversion. Ma'am. So the print um, media type there, where you have ultra premium photo paper luster, mm -hmm. those 
that description, that phrase, is actually right off of the Epson paper package, right? There, it's really designed for Epson paper. So sometimes when you're using a different brand of paper, you have to figure out. <laughs> yeah, we ain't making it easy for you. Any of the, any. About their profiles. But profile's still not a driver setting. Um, I've heard a lot of people call me up, and they're like, I'm using. I don't know, Hannah Mule something, and it just seems like it, uh, there's something wrong with my printer because it's putting too much ink on the paper. Okay, well, it's putting too much ink because it's not the same paper. All of these settings that are in here, they're all designed for Epson papers. If you want, don't have to worry about ink limits and, you know, it's over-inking or it's, it's not feeding enough or it's feeding too much in between each head pass. Just use our paper and make it easy on yourself. But if you want to go through and go the painful route and using somebody else's paper, that's fine too. I can't stop you, but what they are going to tell you with a fine art Hannah Mule paper is they're going to say use some kind of Epson choice. It's not optimal because they didn't design the setting for their paper. We design the settings for our paper and that's what we're going to allow. And really if you have a problem with a Hannah Mule paper and it's over inking, sorry, it's your problem. But we're nice people and I'll show you why we're such nice people. You can download the profile, which is just the color. You cannot download a driver setting. You can't change the ink level on our driver setting. It'll never say under that media type, Hannah Mule 308 or, or Canson Barita, whatever. It's never going to say that. You can't download driver settings. So now the reason why we're so nice is in the Pro Series printers. We've given you the advanced media control window or paper configuration window and some of the other drivers in which you can change ink saturation slightly. You, you, you're not going to make a fine art piece out of using these slider controls. They're really, they're okay. They're not that great, but at least we gave them to you. If you're over inking, you could end up either turning down your color density or increasing the drying time per head pass where it pauses the head in between each pass. And if you're getting lines again because the driver setting of premium luster controls the amount of feed on luster. But if I'm using Ilford's Pearl, which is a little bit thinner than this media is, you might get white lines or you might get overlapping dark lines. You could increase or decrease the feed. Again, I'm still going to go back to you buy your Epson paper, you have the setting, you're done. You have the profile, you're done. It's easy. Uh, hold on, I had one question over here. Sir? That paper feed adjustment thing. Mm -hmm. I'm using this 1400, and I haven't used the interval pick mode. It doesn't work anymore with that because it's too thick. Would that fix if I do that adjustment thing and make it? No, you, got, you kind of killed your printer, and I'll tell you why. The 1400 wasn't designed to take thick paper, thick Hannah Mule paper. 1280 was there was a different feed slot on the 1280 to do that. So basically what ends up happening is that the top automatic tray takes about 280, 280 gram maximum, 10 mil, 11 mil maybe. The Hannah Mule sticker is probably like a 13 to 14 mil, probably about a 315 gram. What ends up happening is there's rubber rollers when it goes in. What ends up happening is because the paper's thicker, and it's thicker than what it was expecting, those rubber rollers start pushing up against it, and after running for a while, those rubber rollers actually get smashed. They compress. So when you go through a lighter sheet of paper. Why did they change that adjustment from the 1280 to the 1400? Well, again, the 1280 was a lot more technically expensive printer. It was a little bit more of a professional printer than the 1400 was. I mean, the 1400's a roughly 199 or 299 printer where the newer equivalent to a 1280 is like really like a 2880. Um, so again going back here, Photoshop manages the colors, picking my printer profile, telling it how to describe the color on a 3880 running luster using my media type of luster, feed, mount of ink, but off in the driver. You can't drive twice. Can't have two people driving at the same time. That's why you'll get those pink images. I noticed I've been using Printer Manager's color based on uh, your last uh, talk. Yep. And I noticed the black point composition has been uh, grayed out. Is it. Uh, and the 
you have sRGB grayed out, does that come in from another location? Well, no, because it's coming in. Uh, let's go back in here. Where here? Yes. That's just by default <laughs> what it puts in. And what about the black point compensation under relative element? Well, you gotta you gotta also remember that basically what ends up happening is because it, you're actually it's adjusting the file and it's actually slightly adding a little bit more contrast. It ends up increasing your black point anyway. Now, the really cool thing about the black and white driver is right now I can turn around and say, um, making sure I have black and white set. So I can just go up here, luster driver, black and white, and turn around and say save, and turn around and say print. So which one's more pleasing? Which one do you like better? So now basically again, I'm taking a color image and I'm just making it black and white without even touching the image. And the driver does a really good job with black and whites. Basically I'm gonna say print. I'm gonna allow the printer to manage the colors because it's basically a printer function. Change your print mode to advanced black and black and white. Just pick which one looks better. It's either gonna be a three or it's gonna be a four. And that's how you do black and white. Cool. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. One other thing. I mean, maybe my printer is too old for a lot of these features. I have the Epson Stylus Pro R1900. It's not too old. So it can do most of this stuff. Yep. Specifically what you're even talking about before you went into the Photoshop stuff, all the stuff you're talking about previously. Every single solid, everything that I've covered so far applies to the 1900. Again, download the color managing guide. I will. It's probably your best thing. You know, work through it. Now, your, your question, a very valid question, well, which one's better? Your eyes, unfortunately. You know, his eyes, her eyes. Which one do you like better? You know, passing around those files, you know, around, some people are going to pick three that look better, some people are going to pick four. And they're going to say it looks better. It's going to be a little hard when the, when the prints get over there, just because it's kind of dark. Um, but really, it's what you decide. I mean, the last seminar that I gave, I mean, I didn't like it. I had to kind of go in the back and kind of split them up. But, but two, uh, there were two guys actually arguing in, the, in my seminar. <laughs> One was saying, I, I, don't even, I don't even care about profiling this and that. Epson supplies. I use one of Epson paper. They give me the profile. My stuff looks great. Then you had another guy in the back of the room. He's like, well, you know, it's not as accurate doing it that way. And, <laughs> The guy in the front of the room is like, well, I really don't care. The prints look great with using a CAN profile. What do I need to do all this profiling, calibrating, and buy three and $4,000 pieces of equipment? You know, you're right, but it really depends on where you want to take it. If you want perfection, you have to make the investment in perfection. But perfection is what? It's still, you know, it, it's still a perception. It, it, it's, it's, it's a moving target, too, because if your color's right, using a 3880 with a canned stuff that comes with it, and you like the way it looks, then you've reached perfection. If you think the blue is slightly off from what you envision, and maybe the profile's a little deficient in that, but then have a profile created. If you don't think the guy that made the profile for you, did a good job, then go out and buy the equipment and make your own. But don't go out and buy a $390, $399 piece of equipment and expect it to do better than what we're giving you. I mean, I'm, I'm being very honest there. Because I'd rather you spend that $399 on some ink and paper <laughs> that says Epson on the back. When you I've always been told, don't let the printer manage the colors because you're doing all your work in Photoshop, uh -huh. and it's going to come out different when you say printer manages. It's not going to come out different. Whatever your changes were, it's going to come out slightly warmer. Bottom line, 
do both. Look at look at both. I'm not I'm not I saying mean, either way is right. Of it looks good, the only thing I can tell you is letting Photoshop determine the colors and picking the profile is going to be more accurate than allowing the then then allow not again. Don't do the comparison to the monitor because again, if you you haven't if you're not illuminating your print to the same color temperature that your monitor's at, then it, it's got nothing to do with it. It more or less as far as if you could actually take a color measurement value of this wall and then I printed out a swatch of this wall, I can match that swatch perfectly with a piece of paper. Okay? Letting Photoshop determine those colors and how it's actually going to print that color on this piece of paper is a more accurate way of doing it. I will get a closer match to that wall color by allowing Photoshop to manage the colors because it's all based on numbers. But Epson's made the driver to give you pleasing color, which again, as I pass this thing around, you might be pleasantly surprised as to which one you picked versus which one is more accurate versus one is less accurate. But accuracy means nothing if you like what the print looks like. That's really it. Soft proofing helps if, again, you're, you're, you're illuminating your print at the same as the monitor is. If, if, if you have two different light sources, if you have no light over your print, it's going to look dark. Soft, soft printing's useless because it's never going to be that bright. Everybody understand, Photoshop manages, the printer doesn't. Printer manages the color management on in the driver, either Adobe RGB or sRGB in the driver. The well, the biggest thing is if you end up using a uh, let Photoshop determine um, colors and you put in a profile. It's using every one of the basically eight inks that are in the machine. Well, there's a total of nine, but it uses eight to print with at any one given time. Where I know that the Epson driver, when I allow the driver to manage the black and white, it actually uses a predominant amount of black, gray, and light gray, and then a little bit of the light cyan and light magenta. And guess what? Totally black and white. I didn't touch the file. The other problem with if you're not the person that creates layers in Photoshop to do black and white conversions, and you're kind of dumb like me, and I just say, convert to black and white, and then I save it, and then I close it. Well, guess what? The color information's gone at that point, and hopefully I have a backup. I am the king of not saving, or I am the king of over-saving, and I save the wrong thing. Usually when I work on a um, presentation, I mean, I, I rarely save it, and then guess what? The computer crashes, and I lose everything. But did Photoshop give you any color toning whatsoever to the black and white? Uh, at that point, you would need to use the settings of the driver because what the driver is going to do is it's going to say, hey, I want to make that black and white. This is the image that's on my screen. Okay? This is what came out of the printer just by choosing advanced black and white. I didn't do anything to the file. I did absolutely nothing. So, next thing is, I ended up basically creating, I should have really renamed them, 3880 charts, but we're going to go in, and now I'm actually going to teach you guys how to make a profile. Again, it's very easy. Anybody can make a profile. Um, I don't necessarily, again, recommend doing this, but I want to show you basically what's involved with it. So even if you contact some of these profile making places on the web, because you're really not satisfied with the color, or maybe you don't have the profile existing and you don't want to make any investment because <coughs> You were looking at the Color Monkey, but you heard me kind of be a, just a tiny, it's not a bad device, but you know, I didn't think it was wonderful for making printer profiles. That's because I've been spoiled by using this stuff. So basically what we're going to turn around and do, um, let me close Color Port. I'm going to open it back up. So this is a free utility that basically I can turn around and I can create targets and measure targets if I have a spectrophotometer. But I still can't create a profile at this point. What is this free? 
Uh, if you go to xright.com, you can basically pick up um, color port again. I can create a target and I can measure the target only if I have a spectra. This is going to generate a TIFF file that I can send through Photoshop over to the printer. So uh, ISIS, that's my device, RGB color space, yes, because I'm going through the driver. I want 1,728 patches. I am going to customize it because I don't want all my same like colors next to each other. I don't like doing that myself. So I'm going to tell it to scramble them. My paper size is going to be letter. I'm going to turn around and save the target. Uh, 3880 patch target. Done. Fine. Next thing I'm going to do is close that, close that, close that, close that, close that, close that, close that. Go to my desktop, find my 3880 patch target. Should have three of them. What do I do? Leave it as it is. Leave it as it is. Let me get on the, my bag of goodies. I gotta give out something different. There you go. It's basically something for like an iPhone or an iPad. Perfect. Cool. Leave as is. I don't want to color manage the document. It doesn't have a profile, but you know what? I don't. You don't want to ever manage any type of color target or any time you're making a profile at all going through. Leave as is for all of them. File, print. Printer manages the colors. One huge important thing. Don't ever scale a patch target. Scaling the patch target changes the size of the squares, which basically you'll probably end up getting an error on the device because the device is looking for a certain size square. And as it scans across, if it's looking for that size square across, and basically the spacing's changing, or the size of that thing's changing, it's not the same. So you're going to get an error. And if you're sending it away to get it done, you're going to have to send it away again. So printer manages the colors, fine and dandy. That's OK. Why? Well, Todd, you said don't, you can't color manage it. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to color manage it. But again, I still want to turn around and tell it what, paper, what type of paper that I'm printing on and what resolution I'm going at. And that's it. Well, that's one target. Let's go to the second target. Same thing. Printer's managing the colors. Looks good. Print settings. Off. Nope. See, would have messed that one up if I didn't check it. No color management. OK, last target. Print, and again. I can't tell you enough, it's so important not to manage any color targets. Wait until you get those profiles loaded in your system after the person creates it for you. And you'd be quite amused at that. Well, actually, I don't know if you would be amused. I would probably be amused at the results. So again, no color management on any type of chart that you're going to do. Now, um, this application isn't too outrageous. It's Chromix uh, ColorThink. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to analyze profiles, analyze, transform, see how things kind of meld and merge together. Um, again, the more advanced user that might be creating their own profiles, you might want to turn around um, you know, and invest in something like this. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, the red, so this red area, whoa, hey. Uh, and basically what I'm comparison here, or comparing. OK. Um, well, I kind of forgot which one's which. Bottom line, one's uh, the bigger one, basically, is the, uh, here we go. OK. So you're going to notice this one that I'm turning on and off is the one that's Epson supplied for um, 
the exhibition fiber paper, which is fairly similar to the luster. And the other one is basically the profile that I created for a 4900. So let's go back to the 3D. The red area that's all up there, again, that's the 7999. That's the one that Epson put in there. The rainbow that's coming out the bottom, let me spin this a little bit quicker. So this whole side, the blues, the purples, some of the pastel colors up here, that's my profile that I created. This is actually better than the one that Epson supplied. But you're really looking at the law of diminishing returns here. How much more color gamut am I getting? Not a lot. Again, it's, it's really perfection, control, what you're looking to do, what you're looking to get is where you want to go with these things. If you're happy with the color that's coming out, and as long as you're doing the setting right in Photoshop and in the driver, your color's always going to come out good. Always. But if you want to get to the next level and better color management and tighter tolerances, then I'd invest in doing it. Biggest thing is illuminating your prints or turning down the brightness on your monitor. Get your printer and your monitor to talk. If you know you're doing everything correctly, then guess what? Get, get your monitor to match your printer and not the other way around. Okay. X-ray target, ISIS disconnected. Okay, that's initializing. Go ahead, ma'am. If you have very little of one color left, will that affect the total nope. color combination? Nope. You basically wait until your, um, your ink's totally empty before you replace them. Bottom line, the suit with Epson was that there was still ink left in the cartridge. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, guess what happens when you run the machine out of ink? You kill the head. If you have a water pump and you're not running water through it, but it's still pumping, you kill the pump. Well. It honestly wasn't worth us pursuing the lawsuit. Really wasn't. Give everybody a forty dollar gift card or whatever it was and walk away from it. Okay, as long as you're saying it's okay to let it empty and then It knows to leave excess ink in the cartridge. And the amusing thing is it's a big thing down in Atlanta. Like everybody's like, Do you know how much ink is left in there? And I'm like, how much? Oh I spent and this was hysterical, eleven hours sucking ink out of a 2200 cartridge with a syringe and I was able to fill up a whole nother set with seven sets of empty cartridges or what we said empty he's like I sucked all the ink I was like what is your time worth <laughs> like why would you sit there with a syringe and a cartridge and suck the, the you know the amount of ink it just didn't make any sense to me not at all Anybody know what enhanced matte is called right now? Hey, say the whole thing five times. Okay. No. Uh, ultra premium presentation paper photo matte or something like that. Enhanced matte was so much easier. Same um, thing. Yeah, same exact paper. It actually says on the box, formerly Epson Media. So, bottom line, what's happening right now? If you notice the top two rows of patches, uh, you're going to notice there's half triangles. Basically, what's happening now is that device is reading across those patches. Now, the top left-hand value of each one of those little squares is basically what it's expecting. The bottom right half of that square or that triangle is basically what it's getting. What ends up happening is once I read all these charts through, and I'm using two different applications only because for some reason, this $3,500 application only gives me a 992 patch target, and I don't think that's enough. One of my other softwares that I use, um, I could actually do a 3,700 patch target, but that takes a little long. But basically, what I'm doing right now is I'm reading this stuff in, and then I basically turn around, and I open up the reference information for, again, what it's looking at and what I actually measured and I hit start, and it makes a profile. 
So I'm going to go turn this around, put this in my hard drive library, color sync, profiles. Say save. I'm just going to go ahead and make a profile. So anybody can make a profile. It's easy. Stick the things in the machine, let it read, brings in some values, tell the software what this is what I'm looking for, this is what you're getting, hit the button, make the profile. You're not making any adjustments yourself. The software is doing it. Anybody else who has questions, come up and see me at the end. Just want to say thanks for your attention. I hope you learned something. Sweet. That almost sounds like a yes. That's awesome. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.